Welcome to the show. This is Brandon Wen, and you're listening to the Understanding Consumer Neuroscience podcast, brought to you by the folks at Cloud Army. In this episode, Richard brings back past guests Rory Sutherland and Steve Keller to discuss the power of audio and its focus at the Nudge Stock Conference. Hi, this is Richard Campbell, and thanks for listening to Understanding Consumer Neuroscience at this very special show we're going to call a mini nudge stock because I have with us today uh, both past guests, Rory Sutherland, who's the vice chair at Ogilvy, and Steve Keller, who's got the best title of them all, the Sonic Strategy Director at SXM Media. Welcome back, gentlemen. Really great to have you here again. Great to be here with everybody. Uh, so we're talking a little bit about nudge stock and the, and the great thing is going on. And I'm excited you're part of this, Steve, because I think audio is one of those underrated aspects of of neuromarketing and marketing in general. Yeah, it's fascinating to me when I go to neuromarketing conferences that, you know, everything that gets looked at in terms of packaging, where things are put on the shelf, where, pe- you know, consumers are in their journey, uh, very little uh, emphasis given to to audio. So that's always a challenge that I give uh, researchers to, to lean into audio from the neuromarketing side. And at the same time, when you talk about classic media for advertising the jingle is a thing it even has its own word right it's uh fallen into a bit of disfavor these days um but it's also evolved you know i i would argue that those short little things that we call audio logos or sonic logos are jingles by any other name they're just maybe not quite as long as a as a full song where you're singing the brand name and certainly we have brand anthems that are pieces of music that we recognize but maybe we don't sing the brand name and that's why we don't call them a jingle but they're still really effective memory devices i don't know that we have the 21st century equivalent of barry manilow writing you know you deserve a break today ever again. Like that's one of a kind thing. No, we just have brands that are willing to spend a lot of money to have shared equity with hit songs, which is a discussion in and of itself. Another angle entirely. Uh, before we were even recording, I mean, we dove straight into the subject. I had to hit the big red button to get going this because Rory was immediately diving into this interesting aspect of the emotional response of audio. I think even more than visually, the, there are incredible emotional responses that come from audio that, the, that both people uh, turn on a song to feel a certain way or feel a certain way so they turn on a song. Yeah. Uh, well, there's all kinds of neurotransmitters and chemicals that are firing in our brain. Um, I caught the tail end of that conversation where Roy was talking about rewards and, you know, the, that drip, drip, drip of the dopamine uh, mm-hmm. that's really addictive. Uh, that's why we like to listen to songs over and over and over again. Certainly that emotional component plays uh, a key part in why we remember music. We might forget where we put our keys, but uh, we might have trouble getting that piece of music out of our heads. And it's because that emotional connection drives it a little bit deeper into our evoked memory. You have oxytocin that's happening when we're singing along to a piece of music together or moving in time with a rhythm. And that oxytocin helps us feel really warm, like we belong. Uh, There's evidence that there's pro-social behavior that's increased as a result of entrainment while we're listening to music together. Uh, so we're, we're literally wired for sound uh, in ways that um, I think are, I might argue, far more superior than the ways we might be uh, wired for, for sight. Uh, and memory is one of those, and emotion are one of those things with, uh, with music that's really powerful. Um, and I, I'd also add that if we know the musical building blocks, we can target emotions. So by changing tempo, articulation, pitch, harmony, rhythm, we can nudge, if you will, emotional states as a result of that. Interesting. And that's very interesting because one of the things I learned about vaping, now this may seem slightly unrelated, but bear with me, okay, is that one of the reasons why patches, gums, sprays never replicated smoking okay, was that all smokers, without being aware of it, learn 
to actually smoke in two completely different ways, depending on whether you want the cigarette to act as a stimulant or a relaxant. And so the cigarette, unlike the spray or the patch, is a kind of mood aileron. You know, it doesn't have a massive, you know, it's not, it's not a massively potent drug, but it can just perk you up if you inhale and exhale in one particular way, or it can calm you down if you perform the same action sort of more slowly, more deeply. Mm-hmm. It's sort of breathing exercise in and of itself. I, mean, I shouldn't really be advertising the virtues of, of smoking or vaping here, but it was very interesting because that ability, which people learn without really being aware of it, to actually control mood to a small degree, is something I think that we really, really value. And so I even had, was approached once by a very, very interesting um, uh, couple of academics who believe they were getting closer and closer to developing effectively playlists mm-hmm. that could have pretty much migrate you from one mood state to another that it, it was that reliable and it, and it begs the question that humans generally seek out this ability to modify their mood in one way or the other yes and certainly audio plays a role in that but there's a bunch of other mechanisms as well and there's a challenge for us as marketers then to press against those levers in a way that encourages a positive response towards a brand or a product. Sure. Well, I think we're we're talking a little bit about congruency if we're talking about mood, and certainly there are a lot of uh, bits of research around uh, you know making sure that you're communicating uh, in a congruent mood state. Unless, of course, maybe you want to excite someone. Maybe mm-hmm. you want to shock them. Uh, there are ways to play with different kind of stimuli to do that. But I think this question of congruency is is really interesting, particularly when it comes to music um, and the conversations around mood. Uh, you know, what do you want to communicate in terms of a feeling? And uh, sometimes there's a, a, a little counterintuitiveness to this as well, because quite often if you think, maybe I'm, I'm feeling down, maybe I should play some happy music to lift me up. Mm-hmm. The research has shown Really, if you lean into the emotion, there's positive effects to that as well. If I'm feeling down, if I kind of lean into that sense of melancholiness, there's a way in which that actually generates feelings of positivity because of the congruency that's there that can help lift us out of those uh, those mood states. Um, and, and another interesting drug, prolactin, uh, which is generated when we cry. It's a, it's a neurochemical that uh, kind of mitigates grief, if you will. There's some mm-hmm. studies that have shown listening to quote unquote sad music actually tricks the brain into grieving a little bit and re- releasing some of that prolactin. Uh, so, what, what is, is it a hormone or is it a? I think that prolactin is a hormone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I said so that, 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 that's but the country. A, that's the hormone. country and Western hormone, effectively. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> when you when you lose your truck, you lose your wife, you lose <laughs> your dog. Everything is gone. <laughs> You know, but interesting to lean into the emotion to sort of fully explore it, and then it lets go. Sure. You know, when you, as soon as you were talking about congruency, I was thinking about the that happy chirpy ad in the middle of a serious news story. You know, on the radio, that that that's a great piece of incongruency that doesn't serve the advertiser well at all. It's it's interesting to think about when our uh, when our ads are experienced and what environment they're in and how they're going to work with that context. And Rory can certainly speak to to context a lot, but that that's really important. Thinking about the context that an individual is in when you're attempting to communicate to them, uh, you know, I mean, you just think about regular communication. Mm-hmm. There's communication that's inappropriate in certain contexts and more appropriate in others. And if we think about our advertising, certainly that's part of what we're trying to do with uh, targeting. Uh, particularly with digital ads, can we pick up on the signals that are there, whether they're um, uh, time of day, whether they may be weather, whether it may be um, understanding what somebody's listening to before or after, uh, attempting to deduce a context, and can you serve an ad that's more appropriate for that context? Um, and would that be more effective? Of course, that's the big question. What certainly seems to be true about music in a, in, as an accompaniment to anything else 
is that the power to take something from good to great mm. seems to rest to a large extent with music. So a very recent example of that will be Succession. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, While well, I would regard, first of all, the opening sequence as being, you know, a work of art in itself. Um, and actually the entire... Is it non-diegetic um, <laughs> soundtrack uh, throughout that? If you act, it's worth actually going back to key moments in succession and just focusing on the music because, of course, in a sense, you're not you're not supposed to focus on the mm-hmm. music. Uh, in that sense, it's supposed to basically evoke mood without you necessarily being directly aware of the process. But you know, or you could take a film like Psycho, mm-hmm. which would be still a very good film without the music, but I don't think it would be remembered as a great film. Um, uh, you know, and, you know, you could all, you know, I mean, the, the, the potency, I mean, let's take an advertisement. There's a wonderful advertisement for coal fires going back to the early 1990s, which uses, it's a, it's a basically a dog, a cat and a mouse all sitting down together in front of a fire contentedly. Okay. And it uses, but will you love me tomorrow? As the soundtrack now you know without that mu- without that apposite music it would still be a pretty good ad mm-hmm. but i don't think we i don't think we remember it to be absolutely candid you know it would still be it would make the point ostensibly but it wouldn't really drive home the point and i think that i think that is i mean i think succession actually is a very very interesting case and a very contemporary example steve do you have favorites i mean it's you're in the business so i imagine it's hard to pick any one but like when you think about great examples of using music yeah I, it it that's like trying to say can you you know pick your your favorite child oh absolutely um, i presume you'd pick one of your own efforts that, that's just a given I, well, I mean actually i'm kind of drawn to interesting stories around music more mm-hmm. than just my own you know personal preferences and uh one of the stories that i love actually predates me but um when the cereal brand wheaties was introduced hmm. uh and um it it almost failed they were having a hard time marketing it. And somebody had come up with a, a fun little jingle. We were talking about jingles. Yeah. A jingle for Wheaties. Uh, and in uh, an, an early example of market research, uh, they started to notice that the Wheaties that were selling were in areas where they were running this jingle. Hmm. On the radio, and wasn't a jingle like uh, "Have you tried Wheaties?" Like yes. it, it wasn't so su- yeah. It's almost like a barber, barbershop quartet style, <laughs> um, you know. And and so they uh, they launched the campaign uh, with that across the country, and uh, sales of Wheaties went through the roof. Wow! And uh, the rest was was history, literally. So uh, you know, I love that example uh, of. Of a piece of music that's associated um, becomes with, the delivery uh, vehicle with an ad. Yeah, exactly. And Mark Ritson, um, the marketing academic, yes. has wonderful data that shows that um, effectively, you know, auditory or sonic branding is one of two extraordinarily potent marketing tools Mm -hmm. to which disproportionately little attention is paid. The other one being brand partnerships. Mm -hmm. Um, I've always thought that brand partnerships are a logical place to start in the sense that um, before we start giving money to Rupert Murdoch, is there anything we can do to symbiotically work with one of the other 100,000 brands on the planet to solve this problem between ourselves um, rather than by necessarily spending money. And it seems just a very sensible philosophical place to start. Similarly, I think probably more ads should actually start with a soundtrack in a way. Um, Historically, the process doesn't work that way. The reason jingles have fallen out of favor, I would argue, is the same as the reason long copy advertising has fallen out of favor. Pure fashion and possibly also the um, distortions, perhaps, of market research. Mm -hmm. Because if you play music in a research group while accompanied by storyboards, it doesn't, you know, it's a completely artificial Mm -hmm. um, 
And, of course, without repetition. It's a completely artificial assessment of the potency of that. And it's an interesting problem that we drop away these techniques that have had success in the past because our modern testing methodology doesn't work with it. Oh, no. I, and I would also argue part of the problem that's happened recently as we've gotten more uh, fascinated with um, performance uh, metrics, where we're leaning more into the short term. And you think of audio-only advertising – and a lot of traditional radio t advertising is that kind of uh, direct marketing approach. It's a wall-to-wall -wall VO, it's performance-based, it's a price point. And yet we've been talking about the power and emotion and using music and sound to build a brand long-term is really powerful. And in chasing some of these short-term metrics, I think what we've also done is uh, – is forgotten about how to use sound in telling a story, how to make connections with emotion, and um, and and we're losing the opportunity to be really creative with uh, music and sound as a result. And as as we said earlier, there aren't that many art forms that bear constant repetition, and there are even mm -hmm. fewer that gain from it. Yeah, I'd probably ex include poetry, very, very good comic writing. You know, you've mm -hmm. got to be up there with P.G. Woodhouse and a tiny, tiny number of films. You know, I, that, that, that's, if you like, why, you know, I kind of venerate Hitchcock, mm -hmm. um, who patently paid a huge amount of attention to music, by the way. But, you know, one of the reasons I venerate Hitchcock is that such a high proportion of his films are rewatchable. Um, and it's quite rare. It's quite hard to do. But, actually, if you use music, you can cheat. Now, this is one of my favourite radio ads. I, I have to apologise mm -hmm. for this because it's very silly. It's a local company. Um, somewhere just across the Thames from me is a place called Raynham. And in Raynham, there's a place that sells sheds called Raynham Sheds, very unimaginatively. And their radio advertising simply took It's Raynham Sheds to the tune of It's Raining Men. Okay. <laughs> Obviously. Okay. Obviously. Okay. It's Raynham Sheds. Hallelujah. It's like the kind of kicks off. <laughs> and then it's just the fact that, you know, big, small, tall, etc., that it sells a wide range of sheds. Now, that was a case of someone I have no idea what the advertising of, of a random shed company, what their budget might be. But, you know, I think I actually go online and re-listen to that kind of once a year because it's just so amusing. <laughs> it's the right amount of ridiculous. It's exactly the right amount of ridiculous. Yeah. yeah it's wonderful. Should we talk a bit about voice? Because I want to separate that from music. I mean, you mentioned the voiceover, wall-to-wall -wall voiceover effects, Steve, but... How, do you spend a lot of time thinking about what voices for voiceover? Like, does that have an impact? Uh, well, totally. I mean, you can think about voice in the same way you think about music. Mm -hmm. Certainly there's rhythm and, and that's an aspect of it. There's repetition. There's the ability to recognize a voice using pitch, using timbre, using tempo. All of those things can communicate emotion. And if you think again, our, we're really, our brains are wired for congruency. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's how we survive by finding the ways things fit. Now we can use things that are incongruent to surprise and maybe delight, but we're, we don't tend to be drawn to incongruency time and time again. So thinking about the sound of a voice as that relates to the other sonic elements or the other visual elements or the, brand attributes, how are you finding congruency in those choices as well? So I think voice is a, is a hugely important part of the uh, sonic palette, if you will, that a, that a brand can, can choose from. And I've got to think, you know, knowing Rory's role, it's like you're looking at the demographic of the potential customer and saying, what voice will this customer respond to? I think that's right. Yes. And actually, you know, there are familiar voices which we have no idea who they belong to, but nonetheless, they carry a sort of uh, weight for that reason. It's funny, actually, which is, you know, I mentioned uh, the, uh, earlier, I mentioned that Neil French, who was creative director of Ogilvy, asked a whole bunch of people in the creative community to list their 10 most memorable moments in film. And the point he was making there was an astoundingly high number of these 
uh, very high proportion, were accompanied by highly distinctive and appropriate music. Um, I also think, um, and this is an interesting debate, the voiceover, although it's absolutely despised by um, most film directors who have the mantra of show, don't tell, Mm -hmm. a significant number of the most enjoyable films actually have a voiceover rather you know someone once said that actually you know the voiceover massively improved blade runner for example goodfellas yeah, and i was exactly the case i was thinking because now you can get yeah. a director's cut version of blade runner without the voiceover which the director didn't like but the studio forced upon them yeah, that was probably a case where the studio was right yeah, de- yeah it depends on who you are i mean it was such an art well, film too but then you also have Harrison Ford doing the voiceover, which is its own gravity. Yeah. Oh, of course, the, the, the public's favorite film of all time, which is The Shawshank Redemption, okay, <laughs> is, is, you know, I mean, it's, it's from a short story, so I suppose it's perfectly lent to narration. But, I mean, that's basically, you know, almost entirely narrated. But it's all, and it's, again... It's Morgan Freeman, so why wouldn't you want to listen to that? Right. Even so though the material you, is no. terrible, but you know it's so powerful. No, no, it's music in itself, actually. Yeah, I mean that's that's an interesting thing, which is the the, the joke I always make in Britain is that the Welsh and the Celts, and the Irish, to some extent, there's a form of conversation which is akin to music in that you're not conversing to convey information, but to demonstrate that you're good at it. It's kind of peacock's tail conversation, mm-hmm. which is almost done for display purposes. Which I think, you know, I think, you know, it, it's just, you know, in a sort of distinctively Celtic way, but you also see it in other in other groups, and it's really, really interesting. You know, there's a certain, you know, Irish facility for storytelling and so on, which I think is is worth noting. Where it's, if if you like, it's bridging the gap between music and speech. I don't disagree, and I think it's very – you've heard those voices that you cannot resist. Yeah. I almost wonder if it detracts from the message at times, that you're just fascinated by the voice rather than the words themselves. Not not a politically correct film example, perhaps, but Zulu, which ends with the voiceover by Richard Burton. Mm. Mm. Another great voice. Uh, you know, de- detailing the number of Victoria Crosses awarded and so forth is almost unimprovable as a way to end a film. Yeah. They're very powerful. You know, we sort of blew past this, this idea of the jingle falling out of favor, perhaps because it's difficult to measure. But here we are, you know, at a time and a place where our measurement tools arguably have never been better. We, we are. Yes. This is the tragedy. This yeah. is the absolute tragedy. Now, I come from a direct marketing background, and I love direct marketing because it's measurable. And the marketing world, I think, came to believe that once you could measure things more – you would be given much more freedom and much more budget. Hmm. Okay. The downside curse, which no one ever anticipated, is that suddenly you'd no longer be allowed to do anything that you can't measure. Right. In other words, they took an optimistic take on measurement and failed to notice the kind of obverse of the coin, which is that um, in a world where you can measure some things, And it is assumed you should attempt to measure more and more. A very large part of the value of all marketing activity is of necessity immeasurable and unattributable. And those are the parts which disproportionately suffer. And music would be a classic example of that. I mean, I think, um, you know, as I said, I mentioned the point about good to great. You know, I think there's a lot of good advertising which would be, uh, you know, which could be greater and you know, could actually reach the level of greatness if that sort of little element of self-indulgence were applied. Can you prove it? No. But yeah. it you know, except except empirically, you know. I mean, I always joke about this, which is some of the empirical findings of advertising, uh, which I think are inarguable, are almost too embarrassingly trivial to um relay, which is one, things with animals in do disproportionately well. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh-huh. Two, things with great music effectively, you know, earn, you know, an extra star in yeah. the consumer's mind. And I think those two things are absolutely provable through any measure of, you know, you know, it's a bit like you won't like this as two Americans, but my argument for constitutional monarchy is simply empirical. You know, that the 
15 countries that practice it, you know, Sweden, the Netherlands, you know, Japan, okay, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, are kind of disproportionately okay. (laughs) (laughs) One monarch seems to get around on that particular scenario. (laughs) No, 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 absolutely, no. But I mean, we don't, we, we don't, We don't know why, okay, but do you necessarily need to know why if there's a reliable kind of correlation, you know, without needing no causation? Mm -hmm. Why why, why take the risk? It is very interesting because, you know, if you you can't really go in as a kind of Ivy League graduate and say – you know, one of our consistent findings is that if you put a gecko or a you know yeah. a chihuahua at the ad, it will be a more successful ad. It'll it'll do well. I'm I mean I'm smitten with this idea of how do we metric the repeatability of something? Yeah, that because that seems very valuable, but clearly not an easy thing to measure. Yeah, I mean you have to measure that over time, mm-hmm. which is you know in in our need for immediacy sometimes with with metrics that becomes uh, difficult uh, i will say though that i have seen you know in the last 10 years in particular um the rise of companies that are more dedicated to measuring uh audio to producing some metrics there uh you know certainly for years we've had in academia we have you know, the music cognition folks, um, the experimental psychologists who have looked at the ways that music and sound have impacted us in, in, in different ways. So there's, a, there's more research out there that's available. I think sometimes the problem is um, maybe we're not thinking about the right questions to ask. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a questions guy. I'm actually, I think finding the right question is probably harder than finding the answer. Yeah. Um, and so what, what are the questions? Um, and then I think, you know, sometimes in our attempt to kind of condense things down with data, uh, we can miss things. Uh, I, I love jazz. I love Miles Davis. And one of my favorite Miles Davis quotes is his talking about, you know, his approach to music. And, um, you know, he, he's, he says, you know, I, I, I don't play what's there. I play what's not there. <laughs> and, I, and I think as, as data scientists, sometimes when we approach data, I think sometimes we need to look at, at what the data is telling us is not there as much as what it's telling us is, is there. Uh, and I think there's a, a creativity that can be found in that kind of, of problem solving. So I'm encouraged because I do think we've, we have more and more uh, opportunities to ask questions, to measure things, but it also, again, will challenge us to, to move beyond short term, to look at long term, uh, and and maybe move outside of some of the typical places that we're going to look for the answers to find better questions. I, I mean, I think there's something wonderful which you could almost refer to, which is how you produce whole brain advertising. Mm-hmm. And of course, mm-hmm. if you heavily rely on research, essentially you're talking to the part of the brain which post rationalizes. And it will always, you know, it will always make sense. It will always say that the point of a dishwasher is to clean your plates and crockery and knives, okay? Whereas, as I jokingly say, deep down the value we derive from a dishwasher is chiefly that it gives you a place to put dirty plates out of sight. You know, the reason it's frustrating when your dishwasher breaks down isn't that you have to wash up by hand. It's that you have to look at the damn look stuff, it, right. okay? Or That's smell right. it, okay? And so... You know, I think that, um, you know, the deeper explanation is often actually opaque to introspection. Now, what interests me about music and humor, having had children, was how early the appreciation for humor and the appreciation for music and dancing appears in children, Mm -hmm. which suggests that it's, if you believe that kind of, uh, the, you know, the development of the fetus all the way through to the child kind of recapitulates evolution to a degree. Mm-hmm. Okay. It suggests that this is something pretty deep. Now, what's glorious about both music and humor is that we, evolutionary scientists have effectively made attempts at explaining it. I think some of which are quite good. Some people believe it's a reward, humor is a reward for kind of error correction. Mm-hmm that you need, you need to have a kind of error correction mechanism when things get ridiculous to prevent things escalating, to prevent things becoming absurd. And therefore, evolution has given us an emotional reward for performing that correction. What the role of music is, 
is even more mysterious, unless, as you say, you believe it's a kind of spandrel. And then, by the way, on my good to great thing, which is that music elevates good things to great, it can actually, as I said, with Raynham Sheds, it can actually rescue pretty bad things. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but um, Curb Your Enthusiasm would be an absolutely mm-hmm. magnificent example where somebody with real genius, you know, without that, without that final track, without indeed the, the soundtrack, it would still, you know, it would still be extremely funny, but I don't think it would reach the heights that it does. An interesting effect that the opening music basically sets your mind in a state for the humor to come. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what's interesting, we were talking about congruency and incongruency. I think a lot of times when music is used in a humorous fashion, it's yeah. it's put in an incongruent fashion. You're mm-hmm. you're hearing something, you know that that uh, is is lighthearted under something that you might think, oh, that should be somber, or vice versa, you know, and and ways that it it kind of shocks us in the in the context in a similar way that that humor does. It reframes things in in a way that maybe we hadn't thought about that, and that uh, that piques our our interest and our curiosity. Um, so I I love this uh, line of thinking about the relationship of uh, of humor to music because I think it's one that's uh, not thought about that often. And in another politically incorrect parallel, perhaps Benny Hill. Yes, uh, about as politically incorrect as you get. <laughs> as far as you can get, but uh, I've already yeah. mentioned Zulu, so I yeah. can't really I can't really go in any deeper. But um, but he certainly transformed yeah. Yakety Sax. Yes, he did. <laughs> Absolutely right. Uh, <laughs> gentlemen, we've had a fun half hour. Uh, obviously, this is the feel of Nudge Stock to me. Coming up on July 7th, any call-outs, things we should mention for folks who want to get more involved? Uh, the website, nudgestock.com. The fact that you can intend, attend in person, mm-hmm. it's in London, uh, on July the 7th. Um, but you can equally well attend online for free. Um, um, and the fact that it's nudgestock.com on July the 7th, he said. <laughs> realizing the value of repetition repetition is powerful if only i could if only i could sing that i would have an excuse to repeat it four more time yeah, yeah. <laughs> all, all we need is a jingle we might even have a plan yes <laughs> we'll, we'll work on that yeah for something sure. humorous something no doubt. <laughs> uh steve keller rory sutherland thanks so much for spending some time with me thank you richard it's been a pleasure thank you very much indeed thanks and thank you for listening to understanding consumer neuroscience